Chapter Twenty Seven of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter Twenty Seven since thou art not as these are go thy ways thou hast no part in all my nights and days lie still sleep on be glad as such things be thou couldst not watch with me luncheon had gone off very pleasantly joyce persuaded by lady baltimore had gone down to it feeling a little shy and conscious of a growing headache but everybody had been charmed to her and baltimore in especial had been very careful in his manner of treating her saying little nice things to her and insisting on her sitting next to him a seat hitherto lady swansdon's own the latter had taken this so perfectly that one night being pardoned for thinking it had been arranged beforehand between her and her host at all events lady swansdown was very sympathetic and indeed everybody seemed bent on treating her as a heroine of the highest order joyce herself felt dull nevertheless words did not seem to come easily to her she was tired she thought and of course she was having spent a sleepless night one little manner gave her cause for thankfulness dysart was absent from luncheon he had gone on a long walking expedition lady baltimore said that would prevent his returning home until dinner hour until quite eight o'clock joyce told herself she was glad of this though why she did not tell herself at all events the news left her very silent but her silence was not noticed it could not be indeed so great and so animated was the flow of beauclerk's eloquence without addressing anybody in particular he seemed to address everybody he kept the whole table alive he treated yesterday's adventure as a tremendously amusing affair and invited everyone to look upon it as he did he insisted on describing miss kavanagh and himself in the same light as he described them earlier to his sister as the modern babes in the wood mrs colney being the robin he made several of the people who had dropped in to luncheon roar with laughter over his description of that excellent innkeeper her sayings her appearance her stern notions of morality that induced her to bring them home personally conducted the size of her waist and her heart and many other things he was extremely funny the fact that his sister smiled only when she felt she must to avoid comment and that his host refused to smile at all and that miss kavanagh was evidently on thorns all the time did not for an instant damp his overflowing spirits it is now seven o'clock miss kavanagh on her way upstairs to dress for dinner suddenly remembering that there is a book in the library left by her early in the afternoon on the central table turns aside to fetch it she forgets however what she has come for when having entered the room she sees dysart standing before the fire staring apparently at nothing to her chagrin she is conscious that the unmistakable start she has made on seeing him is known to him i didn't know you had returned says she awkwardly yet made a courageous effort to appear as natural as usual no i knew you had returned says he slowly it is very late to say good morning says she with a poor little attempt at a laugh but still advancing towards him and holding out her hand too late replied he ignoring the hand 
joyce as if struck by some cruel blow draws back a step or two you are not tired i hope asked dysart courteously oh no she feels stifled choked a desire to get to the door and escape lose sight of him forever is the one strong longing that possesses her but to move requires strength and she feels that her limbs are trembling beneath her it was a long drive however and the storm was severe i fear you must have suffered in some way i have not suffered says she in a dull emotionless way indeed she hardly knows what she says a repetition of his own words seems the easiest thing to bar so she adopts it no there is a considerable pause then no it is true it is i only who have suffered says dysart with an uncontrollable abandonment to the misery that is destroying him i alone you mean something says joyce it is by a terrible effort that she speaks she feels thoroughly unnerved unstrung conscious that the nervous shaking of her hands will betray her she clasps them behind her tightly you mean something just now when you refuse to take my hand but what what you said it was too late replies he and i agreed with you that was not it says she feverishly there was more much more tell me passionately what you meant why you would not touch me why am i to understand that from henceforth you are free from the persecution of my love says dysart deliberately i was mad ever to hope that you would care for me still i did hope that has been my undoing but now well demands she faintly her whole being seems stunned something of all this she had anticipated but the reality is far worse than any anticipation has been she has seen him in her thoughts angry indignant miserable but that he should thus coldly set her aside bid her an everlasting adieu be able to make up his mind deliberately to forget her this had never occurred to her as being even probable now you are to understand that the idiotic farce played between us two the day before yesterday is at an end the curtain is down it is over it was a failure neither you nor i nor the public will ever hear of it again is this because i did not come home last evening in the rain and storm some small spark of courage has come back to her now she lifts her head and looks at him oh be honest with me here in our last hour together cries he vehemently you have cheated me all through be true to yourself for once why pretend it is my fault that we part yesterday i implored you not to go for that drive with him and yet you went what was i or my love for you in comparison with a few hours drive with that lying scoundrel it was only the drive i thought of says she piteously i there was nothing else indeed and you if raising her hand to her throat as if suffocating if you had not spoken so roughly so pshaw says dysart turning from her as if disgusted to him in his present furious mood her grief her fear her shrinkings are all so many movements in the game of coquette at which she is a past mistress will you think me a fool to the end says he see here turning his angry eyes to hers i don't care what you say i know you now too late indeed but still i know you to the very core of your heart you are one mass of deceit a little spasm crosses her face she leans back heavily against the table behind her 
oh no no she says in a voice so low as to be almost unheard you will deny of course says he mercilessly you will even have me believe that you regret the past but you and such as you never regret man is your prey so many scalps to your belt is all you think about why with an accent of passion what am i to you just the filling up of so many hours amusement no more do you think all my eloquence would have any chance against one of his cursed words i might kneel at your feet from morning until night and still i should to be you a thing of naught in comparison with him she holds out her hands to him in a little dumb fashion her tongue seems frozen but he repulses this last attempt at reconciliation it is no good none i have no belief in you left so you can no longer cajole me i know that i am nothing to you nothing if drawing a deep breath through his closed teeth if a thousand years were to go by i should still be nothing to you if he were near i give it up the battle was too strong for me i am defeated lost ruined you have so arranged it says she in a low tone singularly clear the violence of his agitation has subdued hers and rendered her comparatively calm you must permit me to contradict you the arrangement is all your own was it so great a crime to stay last night at falling there is no crime anywhere that you should have made a decision between two men is not a crime no i acknowledge i made a decision but when did you make it last evening and i thought you oh no excuses says he with a frown do you think i desire them he hesitates for a minute or so and now turns to her abruptly are you engaged to him finally no no in accents suggested a surprise so intense as to almost enlarge into disbelief you refused him then no says she again her heart seems to die within her oh the sense of shame that overpowers her a sudden wild terrible hatred of beauclerk takes her into possession why why had he not given her the choice of saying yes instead of no to that last searching question you mean that he he stops dead short as if not knowing how to proceed then suddenly his wrath breaks forth and for that scoundrel that fellow without a heart you have sacrificed the best of you your own heart for him whose word is as light as his oath you have flung behind you a love that would have surrounded you to your dying day good heavens what are women made of but he sobers himself at once as if smitten by some sharp remembrance and pale with shame and remorse looks at her of course says he it is only one heart broken as i am who would have dared thus to address you and it is plain to me now that there are reasons why he should not have spoken before this for one thing you were alone with him for another you are tired exhausted no doubt to-morrow he how dare you says she in a voice that startles him a very low voice but vibrating with outraged pride how dare you thus insult me you seem to think to think that because last night he and i were kept from our home by the storm she pauses that old first odd sensation of choking now again oppresses her she lays her hand upon the back of a chair near her and presses heavily upon it you think i have disgraced myself says she the words coming in a little gasp from her parched lips 
that is why you speak of things being at an end between us oh you wrong me there says the young man who has grown ghastly whatever i may have said i you mean it says she she draws herself up to the full height of her young slender figure and turning abruptly moves toward the door as she reaches it she looks back at him you are a coward she says in a low distinct tone alive with scorn a coward end of chapter 27 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 28 of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter 28 i have seen the desire of mine eyes the beginning of love the season of kisses and sighs and the end thereof miss kavanagh put in no appearance at dinner a chill whispered lady baltimore to everybody in her kindly sympathetic way caught during that miserable drive yesterday she hoped it would be nothing but thought it better to induce joyce to remain quiet in her own room for the rest of the evening safe from draughts and dangers attendant on the barring of her neck and arms so told her small story beautifully but omitted to add that joyce had refused to come downstairs and that she had seemed so wretchedly low-spirited that at last her hostess had ceased to urge her she had however spent a good deal of time arguing with her on another subject the girl's fixed determination to go home to go back to barbara next day lady baltimore had striven very diligently to turn her from this purpose but all to no avail she had even gone so far as to point out to joyce that the fact of her thus leaving the court before the expiration of her visit might suggest itself to some people in a very unpleasant light they might say she has come to the end of her welcome there being given her congee in fact on account of that luckless adventure with her hostess's brother joyce was deaf to all such open hints she remained obstinately determined not to stay a moment longer there than could be helped was it because of norman she was going no she shook her head with such a look of contemptuous indifference that lady baltimore found it impossible to doubt her and felt her heart thereby lightened was it felix miss kavanagh had evidently resented that question at first but finally had broken into a passionate fit of tears and when lady baltimore placed her arms round her had not repulsed her but dear joyce he himself is leaving to-morrow oh let me go home do not ask me to stay i am more unhappy than i can tell you said the girl brokenly you have had a quarrel with him joyce bowed her head in a little quick impatient way it is felix then joyce not norman let me say i am glad for your sake though it is a hard thing for a sister to say of her brother but norman is selfish it is his worst fault perhaps but a bad one as for this little misunderstanding with felix it will not last he loves you dearest most honestly you will make up this tiny never said joyce interrupting her and releasing herself from her embrace her young face looked hard and unforgiving and lady baltimore with a sigh decided on saying no more just then so she went downstairs and told her little tale about joyce's indisposition and was believed by nobody they all said they were sorry 
as in duty bound perhaps they were taking their own view of her absence but dinner went off extremely well nevertheless and was considered quite a success dysart was present and was apparently in very high spirits so high indeed that at odd moments his hostess knowing a good deal stared at him he who was usually so silent a member to-night outshone even the versatile beauclerk in the lightness and persistency of his conversation this sudden burst of animation lasted him throughout the evening carrying him triumphantly across the hour and a half of drawing-room small talk and even lasting till the more careless hours in the smoking-room have come to an end and one by one the men have yawned themselves off to bed then it died so entirely so forlornly as to prove it had been only a mere passing and enforced exhilaration after all they were all gone there was no need now to keep up the miserable farce to seek to prevent their coupling her name with his and therefore discovering the secret of her sad seclusion as dysart found himself almost the last man in the room he too rose reluctantly as though unwilling to give himself up to the solitary musings that he knew lay before him the self umbraidings the vague remorse the terrible dread lest he had been too severe that he knows will be his all through the silent darkness for what have slept and he to do with each other to-night he bade his host good-night and with a pretence of going upstairs turned aside into the deserted library and choosing a book flung himself into a chair determined if possible to read his brain into a state of coma twelve o'clock had struck slowly painfully as if the old timekeeper is sleepy too and is nodding over his work and now one as slowly truly but with the startling brevity that prevents one's dwelling on its drowsy note dysart with a tired groan flings down his book and rising to his feet stretches his arms above his head in an utter abandonment to sleepless fatigue that is even more mental than bodily once the subject of that book had been of an enthralling interest to him to-night it bores him he has found himself unequal to the solving of the abstruse arguments it contains one thought seems to have dulled all others he is leaving to-morrow he is leaving her to-morrow oh surely it is more than the curt pronoun can contain he is leaving in a few short hours his life his hope his one small chance of heaven upon earth how much she had been to him how strong his hoping even against hope had been he never knew till now when all is swept out of his path for ever the increasing stillness of the house seems to weigh upon him rendering even gloomier his melancholy thoughts how intolerably quiet the night is not even a breath of wind is playing in the trees outside on such a night as this ghosts might walk and demons work their will there is something ghastly in this unnatural cessation of all sound all movement what a strange power says emerson there is in silence an old idea yet always new who is there who has not been affected by it has not known that curious senseless dread of spirits present from some unknown world that very young children often feel fear came upon me and trembling which made all my bones to shake says job in one of his most dismal moments and now to dysart this strange unaccountable chill feeling comes insensibly born of the hour and the silence only and with no smallest dread of things intangible 
the small clock on the mantelpiece sends forth a tiny chime so delicate that in broad daylight with broader views in the listeners it might have gone unheard now it strikes upon the motionless air as loudly as though it were the crack of doom poor little clock struggling to be acknowledged for twelve long years of nights and days now is your revenge the fruition of all your small ambitious desires dysart starts violently at the sound of it it is of importance this little clock it has wakened him to real life again he has taken a step toward the door and the bed the very idea of which to this has been treated by him with ignominy when a sound in the hall outside stays him an unmistakable step but so light as to suggest the idea of burglars dysart's spirits rise the melancholy of the moment since deserts him he looks round for the poker that national universal mode of defence when our castles are invaded by the masked men he has not time however to reach it before the handle of the door is slowly turned before the door is as slowly opened and what is this for a second dysart's heart seems to stop beating he can only gaze spellbound at this figure clad all in white that walks deliberately into the room and seemingly directly toward him it is joyce joyce end of chapter twenty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty nine of april's lady this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 29 Sleep, and if life was bitter to thee, pardon. If sweet, give thanks thou hast no more to live and to give thanks is good and to forgive is she dead or still living dysart calm now indeed gazes at her with a heart contracted great heaven how like death she looks and yet he knows she is still in the flesh how strangely her eyes gleam a dull gleam and so passionless her brown hair not altogether fallen down her back but loosened from its hairpins and hanging in a soft heavy knot behind her head gives an additional pallor to her already too white face the open eyes are looking straight before them unseeing her step is slow mechanical unearthly it is only indeed when she lays the candle she holds upon the edge of the table the extreme edge that he knows she is asleep and walking in a dreamland that to waking mortals is inaccessible silently and always with that methodical step she moves towards the fireplace and still a little further until she stands on that eventful spot where he had given up all claim to her and thrown her back upon herself there is the very square on the carpet where she stood some hours ago there she stands now to her right is the chair on which she had leaned in great bitterness of spirit trying to evoke help and strength from the dead oak now in her dreams as if remembering that past scene she puts out her hands a little vaguely a little blindly and the chair not being where in her vision she believes it to be she gropes vaguely for it in a troubled fashion the little trembling hands moving nervously from side to side it is a very sad sight the sadder for the mournful change that crosses the face of the sleeping girl the lips take a melancholy curve the long lashes droop over the sightless eyes a long sad sigh escapes her dysart his heart beating wildly makes a movement 
toward her whether the sound of his impetuous footstep disturbs her dream or whether the coming of her fingers in sudden contact with the edge of the table does it who can tell she starts and wakens at first she stands as if not understanding and then with a terrified expression in her now sentient eyes looks hurriedly around her her eyes meet dysart's don't be frightened begins he quickly how did i come here interrupts she in a voice panic-stricken i was upstairs i remember nothing it was only a moment since that i was i asleep she gives a hastily furtive glance at the pretty loose white garment that enfolds her i suppose so says dysart you must have had some disturbing dream and it drove you down here it is nothing many people walk in their sleep but i never oh what is it says she as if appealing to him to explain herself to herself was faintly flushing any one else here did any one see me no one they are all in bed all asleep and you doubtfully i couldn't sleep returns he slowly gazing fixedly at her i must go says she feverishly she moves rapidly toward the door her one thought seems to be to get back to her own room she looks ill unstrung frightened this new phase in her has alarmed her what if for the future she cannot even depend upon herself cannot know where her mind will carry her when deadly sleep has fallen upon her it is a hateful thought and to bring her here where he was what power has he over her oh the sense of relief in thinking that she will be at home to-morrow safe with barbara her hand is on the door she is going joyce says dysart suddenly sharply all his soul is in his voice so keenly it rings that involuntarily she turns to him great agony must make itself felt and to dysart seeing her on the point of leaving him for ever it seems as though his life is being torn from him in truth she is his life the entire happiness of it if she goes through that door unforgiving she will carry with her all that makes it bearable she is looking at him her eyes are brilliant with nervous excitement her face pale her very lips have lost their color yes says she interrogatively impatiently i am going away to-morrow i shall not yes yes i know i am going too i shall not see you again i hope not i think not she makes another step forward opening the door with a little light touch she places one hand before the candle and peers timidly into the dark hall outside don't let that be your last word to me says the young man passionately joyce hear me there must be some excuse for me excuse says she looking back at him over her shoulder her lovely face full of curious wonder yes yes i was mad i didn't mean a word i said i swear it i joyce forgive me the words though whispered burst from him with a despairing vehemence he would have caught her hand but that she lifts her eyes to his such eyes there is a little pause and then oh no never never says she her tone is very low and clear not angry not even hasty or reproachful only very sad and certain it kills all hope she goes quickly through the open doorway closing it behind her the faint ghostly sound of her footfalls can be heard as she crosses the hall after a moment even this light sound ceases she is indeed gone it is all over with a kind of desire to hide herself joyce has crept into her bed sore at heart angry miserable no hope that sleep will again visit her 
has led her to this step and indeed would sleep be desirable what a treacherous part it had played when last it fell on her how grieved he looked how white he was evidently most honestly sorry for all the unkind things he had said to her not that he had said many indeed only he had looked them and she she had been very hard oh too hard however there was an end to it to-morrow would place more miles between them in every way that would ever be recrossed he would not come here again until he had forgotten her married probably they would not meet there should be have been comfort in that certainty but alas when she sought for it it eluded her it was not there in spite of the trick somnus had just played her she would now gladly have courted him again if only to escape from ever-growing regret but though she turns from side to side in a vain endeavour to secure him that cruel god persistently denies her and with mournful memories and tired eyes she lies watching waiting for the tender breaking of the dawn upon the purple hills slowly slowly comes up the sun coldly and with a tremendous lingering the light shines on land and sea then sounds the bursting chants of birds the rush of streams the gentle sighings of the winds through herb and foliage joyce thankful for the blessed daylight flings the clothes aside and with languid step and eyes sad always but grown weary too with sleeplessness and thoughts unkind moves lightly to the window throwing wide the casement she lets the cool morning air flow in a new day has arisen what will it bring her what can it bring save disappointment only and vain regret oh why must she of all people be thus unblessed upon this blessed morn never has the sun seemed brighter the whole earth a greater glow of glory welcome the lord of light and lamp of day welcome fosterer of tender herbus green welcome quickener of florist flowers sheen welcome de painter of the bloomit means welcome the life of everything that spreads yet to joyce welcome to the rising sun seems impossible what is the good of day when hope is dead in another hour or two she must rise go downstairs talk laugh and appear interested in all that is been said and with a heart at variance with joy a poor heart heavy as lead a kind of despairing rage against her crooked fortune moves her why has she been thus unlucky why at first should a foolish vagrant feeling have led her to think so strongly of one unworthy and now hateful to her as to prejudice her in the mind of one really worthy what madness possesses her surely she is the most unfortunate girl alive a sense of injustice bring the tears into her eyes and blots out the slowly widening landscape from her view how happy some or other some can be her thoughts run to barbara and monkton they are happy in spite of many frowns from fortune they are poor as society counts poverty but the want of money is not a cardinal evil they love each other and the children are things to be loved as well darling children well grown and strong and healthy though terrible little turks at times god bless them oh that she could count herself as blessed as barbara whose greatest trouble is to deny herself this and that to be able to pay for the other thing no to be poor is not to be unhappy our happiness in this world says a writer depends on the affections we are able to inspire truly she joyce has not been successful in her quest 
for if he had loved her would he ever have doubted her perfect love says the oldest grandest testimony of all casteth out fear and he had feared sitting here in the dawning daylight the tears ran softly down her cheeks it is a strange thing but true that never once during this whole night's dreary vigil do her thoughts once turn to beauclerk end of chapter twenty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter thirty oh there's stony a leaf in athol wood and mony a bird in its breast and mony a pain may the heart sustain ere it sab itself to rest barbara meets her on the threshold and draws her with loving arms into the dining-room i knew you would be here at this hour lady baltimore wrote me word about it and i have sent the chicks away to play in the garden as i thought you would like to have a comfortable chat just at first lady baltimore wrote yes dear just to say you were distressed about that unfortunate affair that drive you know and that you felt you wanted to come back to me i was glad you wanted that darling you are not angry with me barbara asked the girl loosening her sister's arms the better to see her face angry no how could i be angry said mrs monkton the more vehemently in that she knows she had been very angry just at first it was the merest chance it might have happened to anybody one can't control storms no that's what mrs connolly said only she called it the eliminance says joyce with quite a little ghost of a smile well now you are home again and it is all behind you and there is really nothing in it and you must not think so much about it says barbara fondling her hand lady baltimore says you are too unhappy about it did she say that what else did she say asked the girl regarding her sister with searching eyes what had lady baltimore told her that impulsive admission to the latter last night had been troubling joyce ever since and now to have lay bare her heart again to acknowledge her seeming fickleness to receive barbara's congratulation on it only to declare that this second lover has too been placed by fate outside her life seems too bitter to her oh no she cannot tell barbara why nothing says mrs monkton who is now busying herself removing the girl's hat and furs what was there to tell after all she is plainly determined to treat the matter lightly oh there is a good deal says joyce bitterly why don't you tell me turning suddenly upon her sister that you knew how it would be all along that you distrusted that mr beauclerk from the very first and that felix dysart was always worth a thousand of him there is something that is almost defiant in her manner because for one thing i very seldom call him felix says mrs monkton with a smile alluding to the last accusation and because too i can't bear the i told you so persons you mustn't class me with them joyce whatever you do i shan't be able to do much more at all events says joyce presently that's one comfort not only for myself but for my family i expect i have excelled myself this time well with a dull little laugh it will have to last so 
Joyce, says her sister quickly, tell me one small thing. Mr. Beauclerk, he— Yes, stonily, as Barbara goes on a rock. You— you are not engaged to him. Joyce breaks into an angry laugh. That is what you all ask, says she. There is no variety, none. No, no, no. I am engaged to nobody. Nobody wants me, and I— I care for nobody, not I, for nobody cares for me. Mark the heavy emphasis on the four. I beg you, Barbara. She breaks entirely from her sister's hold and springs to her feet. You are tired, says Mrs. Monkton, anxiously rising too. Why don't you say what you really mean, says Joyce, turning almost fiercely to her. Why pretend you think I am fatigued when you honestly think I am miserable? Because Mr. Beauclerk has not asked me to marry him. No, I don't care what you think. I am miserable. And though I were to tell you over and over again it was not because of him, you would not believe me, so I will say nothing. Here is Freddy, says Mrs. Monkton nervously, who has just seen her husband's head pass the window. He enters the room almost as she speaks. Well, Joyce, back again, says he affectionately. He kisses the girl warmly horrid drive you must have had through that storm you too blame the storm then and not me says joyce with a smile everybody doesn't take your view of it it appears i should have returned in all that rain and wind and pshaw never listen to extremists says mr monkton sinking lazily into the chair they will land you on all sorts of barren coasts if you give ear to them. For my part, I never could see why two people of opposite sexes, if overcome by nature's artillery, should not spend a night under a wayside inn without calling down upon them the social artillery of gossip. There is only one thing in the whole affair, says Mr. Monkton seriously, that has given me a moment's uneasiness. And that, says Joyce nervously, is how I can possibly be second to both of them. Dysart, I confess, has my sympathies, but if Beauclerk were to appear first upon the field and implore my assistance, I feel I should have a delicacy about refusing him. Freddy, says his wife reprovingly. Oh, as for that, says Joyce with a frown, I do think men are the most troublesome things on earth she burst out presently when one isn't loving them one is hating them how many of them at a time asked her brother-in-law with deep interest not more than two joyce please i couldn't grasp any more my intellect is of a very limited order so is mine i think says joyce with a little tired sigh monkton although determined to treat the matter lightly looks very sorry for her. Evidently she is out of joint with the whole world at present. How did Lady Baltimore take it? asks he, with all the careless air of one asking a question on some unimportant subject. She was angry with Mr. Beauclerk for not leaving me at the inn and coming home himself. Unsisterly woman! She was quite right after all, said Mrs. Monkton, who had defended Beauclerk herself, but cannot bear to hear another take his part. And Dysart? How did he take it? asked Monkton, smiling. I don't see how he should take it, anyway, says Joyce coldly. Not even with soda water? says, his, says her brother-in-law. Of course it would be too much to expect him to take it neat. You broke it gently to him, I hope. Ah, you don't understand, Mr. Dysart, says the girl, rising abruptly. I did not understand him until yesterday. So he is very abstruse? He is very insolent, says Miss Cavanagh, with a sudden touch of fire that makes her sister look at her with some uneasiness. I see, 
says Mr. Monkton slowly. He still, unfortunately, looks amused. One does not know anybody until he or she gives way to a towering passion. So he gave you a right good scolding for being caught in the rain with Beauclerk. A little unreasonable, surely, but lovers never yet were famous for their common sense. That little ingredient was forgotten in their composition. And so he gave you a lecture. Well, he was not likely to do it again says she slowly no then it is more than likely than i shall be the one to be scolded presently he won't be able to content himself with silence he will want to air his grievances to revenge them on some one and if you refuse to see him i shall be that one there is really only one shall small remark to be made about this whole matter said mr monkton with a rueful smile and it remains for me to make it if you will encourage two suitors at the same time my good child the least you may expect is trouble you are bound to look out for breakers ahead but and this is the remark it is very hard lines for a fourth and most innocent person to have those suitors dropped straight on him without a second's notice i am not a born warrior the brunt of the battle is a sort of gaiety that i confess myself unsuited for i haven't been educated up to it i there will be no battle says joyce in a strange tone because there will be no combatants for a battle there must be something to fight for and here there is nothing you are all wrong freddy you will find out that after a while i have a headache barbara i think raising her lovely but pained eyes to her sister i should like to go into the garden for a little bit the air there is always so sweet go darling says barbara whose own eyes have filled with tears oh freddy turning reproachfully to her husband as the door closes on joyce how could you so have taken her you must have seen how unhappy she was and all about that horrid beauclerk monkton stares at her so that is how you read it says he at last there is no difficulty about the reading could it be in larger print large enough certainly as to the unhappiness but for beauclerk i should advise the printer to insert dysart dysart felix unless indeed you could suggest a third nonsense says mrs monkton contemptuously she has never cared for poor felix how i wish she had he is worth a thousand of the other but the girls are so perverse they are that is just my point says her husband joyce is so perverse that she won't allow herself to see that it is dysart she preferred however there is one comfort she is paying for her perversity freddy says his wife after a long pause do you really think that what the girls are perverse no no that she likes felix best that is indeed my fixed belief oh freddy cries his wife throwing herself into his arms how beautiful of you i've always wanted to think that but never could until now now that my clear judgment has been brought to bear upon it quite right my dear always regard your husband as sort of demigod who poof says she do you think i was born without a grain of sense but really freddy oh if it might be poor poor darling how sad she looked if they have had a serious quarrel over the drive with that detestable beauclerk why i here she burst into tears and with her face buried on monkton's waistcoat makes little wild dabs at the air with a right hand that is only to be appeased by having monkton's handkerchief thrust into it 
what a baby you are says he giving her a loving little shake i declare you were well named the swift transitions from the tremendous barbara to the inconsequent baby takes but an instant and exactly expresses you a moment ago you are bent on withering me now i am going to wither you oh no don't says she half laughing half crying and besides it is you who are inconsequent you never keep to one point for a second why should i says he when it is such a disagreeable one there let us give up for the day we can write to be continued after it and begin a fresh chapter to-morrow meantime joyce making her way to the garden with the hope of finding there at all events silence an opportunity for thought seats herself upon a garden chair and gives herself up a willing prey to melancholy she has desired to struggle against this evil but it has conquered her and tears rising beneath her lids are falling on her cheeks when two small creatures emerging from the summer house on her left catch sight of her they had been preparing for a rush a real redshank painted and feathered descent upon her when something in her sorrowful attitude becomes known to them fun dies within their kind little hearts their joys has come home to them that is a matter for joy but their joys has come home unhappy that is a matter for grief step by step hand in hand they approach her and even at the very last with their little breasts overflowing with the delight of getting her back it is with a very gentle precipitation that they throw themselves upon her and it never occurs to them either to trouble her for an explanation no probing questions issue from their lips she is sorry that is all it is enough for their sympathies too much joyce herself is hardly aware of the advent of the little comforters until two small arms steal around her neck and she finds mabel's face pressed close against her own let me kiss her too says tommy trying to brush his sister away and resenting openly the fact of her having secured the first attempt at consolation you mustn't tease her she's sorry she's very sorry about something says mabel turning up joyce's face with her pink palm aren't you joyce there's droppies in your eye a little darling says joyce brokenly then i'll be sorry with you says the child with all childhood's divine intuition that to sorrow alone is to know a double sorrow she hugs joyce more closely with her tender arms and joyce after a battle with her braver self gives way and breaks into bitter tears there now you've made her cry right out you're a naughty girl says tommy to his sister in a raging tone meant to hide the fact that he too himself is on the point of given way in fact another moment sees him dissolved in tears never mind joycey never mind we love you sobs he getting up on the back of the seat behind her and making a very excellent attempt at strangulation do you there doesn't seem to be any one else then but you says poor joyce dropping mabel onto her lap and tommy more to the front and clasping them both to her with a little convulsive movement perhaps the good cry she has on top of those two loving little heads does her more good than anything else could possibly have done end of chapter thirty Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 31 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter 31 A bitter and perplexed, what shall I do? Is worse to man than worse necessity. Three months have come and gone, and winter is upon us. It is close on Christmas tide indeed. All the trees lie bare and desolate. The leaves have fallen from them, and their sweet denizens, the birds, flown or dead. Evening has fallen. The children are in the nursery, having a last romp before bed hour. Their usual happy hunting ground for that final fling is the drawing room, but finding the atmosphere there to night distinctly cloudy, they had beaten a simultaneous retreat to Bridget and the battered old toys upstairs. Children, like rats, dislike discomfort. Mrs. Monkton, sitting before the fire that keeps up a continuous sound as musical as the rippling of a small stream, is leaning back in her chair, her pretty forehead puckered into a thousand doubts. Joyce, near her, is as silent as she is, while Mr. Monkton, after a vain pretense at being absorbed in the morning paper, diligently digested at eleven this morning, flings it impatiently on the floor. What's the good of your looking like that, Barbara? If you were compelled to accept this invitation from my mother, I could see some reason for your dismal glances. But when you know I am as far from wishing you to accept it as you are yourself, why should? Ah, but are you? says his wife with a swift, dissatisfied glance at him. The dissatisfaction is a good deal directed towards herself. If you could make her sure of that, says Joyce softly, I have tried to explain it to her, but— I suppose I am unreasonable, says Barbara, rising, with a little laugh that it has a good deal of grief in it. I suppose I ought to believe, turning to her husband, that you are dying for me to refuse this invitation from the people who have covered me with insult for eight years, when I know well that you are dying for me to accept it. Oh, if you know that, says Monkton rather feebly, it must be confessed. This fatally late desire on the part of his people to become acquainted with his wife and children has taken hold of him, has lived with him through the day, not for anything he personally could possibly gain by it, but because of a deep desire he has that they, his father and mother, should see and know his wife, and learn to admire her and love her. Of course I know it, says Barbara almost fiercely. Do you think I have lived with you all these years and cannot read your heart? Don't think I blame you, Freddy. If the cases were reversed, I should feel just like you. I should go at any lengths to be at one with my own people. I don't want to go to even the shortest length, says Mr. Monkton, as if a little nettled he takes up the dull old local paper again and begins a third severe examination of it. But Mrs. Monkton, feeling that she cannot survive another silence, lays her hand upon it and captures it. Let us talk about it, Freddy, says she. It will only make you more unhappy. Oh, no, I think not. It will do her good, says Joyce anxiously. Where is the letter? I hardly saw it. Who is asked? demands Barbara feverishly. Nobody in particular, except you. My father has expressed a wish that we should occupy that house of his in Harley Street for the winter months, and my mother puts in, accidentally as it were, that she would like to see the children, but you are the one specifically alluded to. They are too kind, says Barbara rather unkindly to herself. I quite see it in your light. It is an absolute impertinence, 
says Monkton, with a suppressed sigh. I allow all that. In fact, I am with you, Barbara. Although, why keep me thinking about it? Put it out of your head. It requires nothing more than a polite refusal. I shall hate to make it polite, says Barbara, and then, recurring to her first and sure knowledge of his secret desires, you want to go to them? I shall never go without you, returns he gravely. Ah, that is almost a challenge, says she, flushing. Barbara, perhaps he is right, says Joyce gently. As she speaks, she gets up from the fire and makes her way to the door, and from that to her own room. Will you go without me? says Barbara, when she has gone, looking at her husband with large, earnest eyes. Never. You say you know me thoroughly, Barbara. Why then ask the question? Well, you will never go then, says she, for I, I will never enter those people's doors. I couldn't, Freddy. It would kill me. She has kept up her defiant attitude so successfully and for so long that Mr. Monkton is now electrified when she suddenly bursts into tears and throws herself into his arms. You think me a beast, says she, clinging to him. You are tired. You are bothered. Give it up, darling, says he, patting her on the back, the most approved modern plan of reducing people to a stale of common sense. But you do think it, don't you? No, Barbara. There now, be a good sensible girl, and try to realize that I don't want you to accept this invitation, and that I am going to write to my mother in the morning to say it is impossible for us to leave home just now, as, as, a, oh, anything will do, as baby is not very well. That's the usual polite thing, eh? Oh, no, don't say that, says Mrs. Monkton in a little frightened tone. It's, it's unlikely. It might, I'm not a bit superstitious, Freddy, but it might affect baby in some way, do him some harm. Very well, we'll tell another lie, says Mr. Monkton cheerfully. We'll say you've got the neuralgia badly and that the doctor says it would be as much as your life is worth to cross the channel at this time of year. That will do very well, says Mrs. Monkton readily. But I am not a bit superstitious, says he solemnly, but it might affect you in some way, do you some harm, and if you are going to make a jest of it, Freddy, it is you who made the jest. Well, never mind, I accept the responsibility, and will create even another tarry-diddle. If I say we are disinclined to leave home just now, will that do? Yes, says she, after a second struggle with her better self, in which it comes off the loser. That's settled, then, said Mr. Monkton. Peace with honour is assured. Let us forget that unfortunate letter, and all the appurtenances thereof. Yes, do let us, Freddy, says she, as if with all her heart. But the morning convinces Monkton that the question of the letter still remains unsettled. Barbara, for one thing, has come down to breakfast gowned in her very best morning frock, one reserved for those rare occasions when people drop in overnight and sleep with them. She has, indeed, all the festive appearance of a person who expects to be called away at a second's notice in a very vertex of dissipation. Joyce, who is quite as impressed as Monkton with her appearance, gazes at her with a furtive amazement, and both she and Monkton wait in a sort of studied silence to know the meaning of it. They aren't given long to possess their souls in patience. Freddy, I don't think Mabel ought to have any more jam, says Mrs. Monkton presently, or Tommy either. She looks at the children as she speaks and sighs softly. It will cost a great deal, says she. The jam, says her husband, well, really, at the rate they are consuming it, I, oh no, the railway, the boat, the fare, the whole journey, says she. 
the journey says joyce why to england to take them over there to see their grandmother says mrs monkton calmly but barbara well dear i thought barbara i really consider that question decided says her husband not severely however is the dearest wish of his heart to be accomplished at last i thought you had finally made up your mind to refuse my mother's invitation i shall not refuse it says she slowly whatever you may do i you said you didn't want to go says his wife severely but i have been thinking it over and her tone has changed and a slight touch of pink has come into her pretty cheeks after all freddy why should i be the one to keep you from your people you aren't keeping me don't go on that well then will you go by yourself and see them certainly not not even if i give you the children to take over not even then you see says she with a sort of sad triumph i am keeping you from them what i mean is that if you had never met me you would now be friends with them i'd a great deal rather be friends with you says he struggling wildly but firmly with a mutton chop that has been done to death by a bad cook i know that in a low and troubled tone but i know too that there is always unhappiness where one is on bad terms with one's mother and father my dear girl i can't say what be you have got in your bonnet now but i beg you to believe i am perfectly happy at this present moment in spite of this confounded chop that has been done to a chip god sends meat the devil sends cooks that's not a prayer tommy you need not commit it to memory but there's god and the devil in it says tommy skeptically that always means prayers not this time and you can't pray to both your mother has taught you that you should teach her something in return that's only fair isn't it she knows everything says tommy dejectedly it is quite plain to his hearers that he regrets his mother's universal knowledge that he would have dearly liked to give her a lesson or two not everything says his father for example she cannot understand that i am the happiest man in the world she imagines i should be better off if she was somebody else's wife and somebody else's mother whose mother demands tommy his eyes growing round ah that's just it you must ask her she is evidently some a rare pince freddy says his wife in a low tone well what am i to think you see to tommy who is now deeply interested if she wasn't your mother she'd be somebody else's no she wouldn't breaks in tommy indignantly i wouldn't let her i'd hold on to her i with his mouth full of strawberry jam yet striving nobly to overcome his difficulties of expression i'd beat her you shouldn't usurp my privileges says his father mildly barbara says joyce at this moment if you have decided on going to london i think you have decided wisely and it may not be such an expense after all you and freddy can manage the two eldest children very well on the journey and i can look after baby until you return or else take nurse and leave baby entirely to me mrs monkton makes a quick movement End of chapter 31 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 32 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter 32. And I go to brave a world I hate. 
and woo it o'er and o'er and tempt a wave and try a fate upon a stranger shore i shall take the three children and you too or i shall not go at all says she addressing her sister with an air of decision if you have really made up your mind about it says mr monkton i agree with you the house in harley street is big enough for a regiment and my mother says the servants will be in it on our arrival if we accept the invitation joyce will be a great comfort to us and a help on the journey over the children are so fond of her joyce turns her face to her brother-in-law and smiles in a little pleased way she has been so grave of late that they welcome a smile from her now at any time and even court it the pretty lips erstwhile so prone to laughter are now too serious by far when therefore monkton or his wife go out of their way to gain a pleased glance from her and succeed both feel as if they have achieved a victory why have they offered us a separate establishment was there no room for us in their own house asks mrs monkton presently i dare say they thought we should be happier so in a place of our own well i dare say we shall she pauses for a moment why are they in town now at this time of year why are they not in their country house ah oh, that is a last thorn in their flesh says monkton with a quick sigh they have had to let the old place to pay my brother's debts he is always a trouble to them this last letter points a greater trouble still and in their trouble they have turned to you to the little grandchildren says joy softly one can understand it oh yes oh you should have told me says barbara flushing as if with pain i am the hardest person alive i think you think it looking directly at her husband i think only one thing of you says mr monkton rising from the breakfast table with a slight laugh it is what i have always thought that you are the dearest and loveliest thing on earth the bantering air he throws into this speech does not entirely deprive it of the truthful tenderness that formed it there he says that ought to take off the gloom of the brow of any well-regulated woman coming as it does from an eight-year-old husband oh you must be older than that says she at which they all laugh together you're wise to go barbara says joyce now in a livelier way as if that last quick unexpected feeling of amusement has roused her to a sharper sense of life if once they see you no you mustn't put up your shoulder like that i tell you if once they looked at you they would feel the measure of their folly i shall end by fancying myself says mrs monkton impatiently and then you will all have fresh work cut out for you the bringing of me back to my proper senses well with a sigh as i have to see them i wish what that there could be a hearty believer in your and joyce's flattery or else that they your people are not so prejudiced against me it will be an ordeal when you are about it with them a few grains of common sense says her husband wrathfully just fancy the folly of an impertinence that condemned a fellow being on no evidence whatsoever neither eye nor ear were brought in as witnesses oh well says she considerably mollified by his defamation of his people i they say they are not so much to be blamed after all and with a little quick laugh at her sister as joyce says my beauties are still unknown to them they will be delighted when they see me they will indeed returns joyce stolidly and so you are really going to take me with you oh i am glad i haven't spent any of my money this winter barbara i have some therefore i have always wanted to see london it will be a change for the children too says barbara with a troubled sigh i suppose to her husband they will think them very countrified who your mother what do you think of them oh that has got nothing to do with it everything rather you are analyzing them you are exalting an old woman who has been unkind to you at the expense of the children who love you ah oh, she analyzes them because she too loves them says joyce it is easy to pick fault in those who have a real hold upon our hearts for the rest it doesn't concern us how the world regards them it sounds as if it ought to read the other way round says monkton no no to love is to see faults not to be blind to them the old reading is wrong says joyce you are unfair freddy declares his wife with dignity 
I would not decry the children. I am only a little nervous as to their reception. When I know that your father and mother are prepared to receive them as my children, I know they will get but little mercy at their hands. That speech isn't like you, says Morton, but it is impossible to blame you for it. They are the dearest children in the world, says Joyce. Don't think of them. They must succeed. Let them alone to fight their own battles. You may certainly depend upon Tommy, says his father, for any emergency that calls for fists and heels where battle murder and sudden death are to be locked for, Tommy will be all there. Oh, I do hope he will be good, says his mother, half amused but plainly half terrified as well. Two weeks later sees them settled in town, in the Harley Street house that seems enormous and unfriendly to Mrs. Moncton, but delightful to Joyce and the children, who wander from room to room and, under her guidance, pretend to find bears and lions and boogies in every corner. The meeting between Barbara and Lady Moncton had not been satisfactory. There had been very little said on either side, but a chill that lay on the whole interview had never been thought for a moment. Barbara had been stiff and cold, if entirely polite, but not at all the Barbara to whom her husband had been up to this accustomed. He did not blame her for the change of front under the circumstances, but he could hardly fail to regret it, and it puzzled him a great deal to know how she did it. He was dreadfully sorry about it secretly, and would have given very much more then the whole thing was worse to let his father and mother see his wife as she really is, the true Barbara. Lady Monckton had been stiff, too, unpardonably so, as it was certainly her place to make amends, to soften and smooth down the preliminary embarrassment. But then she had never been framed for suavity of any sort, and an old aunt of Monckton's, a sister of hers, had been present during the interview and had helped considerably to keep up the frigidity of the atmosphere. She was not a bad old woman at heart, this aunt. She had indeed from time to time given up all her own small patrimony to help her sister to get the eldest son out of his many disreputable difficulties. She had done this partly for the sake of the good old family names on both sides, and partly because the younger George Monckton was very dear to her. From his early boyhood the scapegrace of the family had been her admiration, and still remained so in imagination. For years she had not seen him, and perhaps this, that she considered a grievance, was a kindness of vouchsafed to her by providence. Had she seen the pretty boy of twenty years ago, as he now is, she would not have recognized him, the change from the merry, blue-eyed, daring lad of the past to the bloated, blear-eyed, reckless-looking man of today would have been a shock too cruel for her to bear. But this she was not allowed to realize, and so remained true to her belief in him as she remembered him. In spite of her many good qualities, she was nevertheless a dreadful woman, the more dreadful to the ordinary visitor because of the false front she wore, and the flashing purchased teeth that shone on her upper jaw. She lived entirely with Sir George and Lady Monckton, having indeed given them every penny that would have enabled her to live elsewhere. Perhaps of all the many spites they owned their elder son, the fact that his inquisities had inflicted upon them his maternal aunt for the rest of her natural days was the one that rankled keenest. She disliked Frederick not only intensely, but with an openness that had its disadvantages, not for any greater reason than that he had behaved himself so far in his journeys through life more credibly than his brother. She had always made a point against him of his undutiful marriage, and never failed to add fuel to the fire of his father's and mother's resentment about it, whenever that fire seemed to burn low. Altogether, she was by no means an amiable old lady, and being very hideous into the bargain, was not much run after by society generally. She wasn't of the least consequence in any way, being not only old but very poor, yet people dreaded her and would slip away round doors and corners to avoid her tongue. 
she succeeded in spite of all drawbacks in making herself felt and it was only one or two impervious beings such as dicky brown for example who knew the monktons well and was indeed distantly connected with them through his mother who could endure her manners with any attempt at equanimity end of chapter thirty two recording by monica Rolly. chapter thirty three of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by monica rolly april's lady by margaret wolfe hungerford chapter thirty three strength wanting judgment and policy to rule overturneth itself it was quite impossible of course that a first visit to lady monkton should be a last from barbara lady monkton had called on her the very day after her arrival in town but barbara had been out then on the occasion of the latter's return visit the old woman had explained that going out was a trial to her and barbara in spite of her unconquerable dislike to her had felt it to be her duty to go and see her now and then the children too had been a great resource sir george especially had taken to tommy who was quite unabashed by the grandeur of the stately if faded old rooms in the belgravian mansion but was full of curiosity and spent his visits to his grandfather cross-examining him about divers matters questionable and otherwise that tickled the old man and kept him laughing it had struck barbara that sir george had left off laughing for some time he looked haggard uneasy miserable expectant she liked him better than she liked lady monkton and though reserved with bows relaxed more to him than to her mother-in-law for one thing sir george had been unmistakably appreciative of her beauty and her soft voice and pretty manners he liked them all lady monkton had probably noticed them quite as keenly but they had not pleased her they were indeed an offence they had placed her in the wrong as for old miss lestrange the aunt she regarded a young wife from the first with a dislike she took no pains to conceal this afternoon one of many that barbara has given up to duty finds her as usual in lady monkton's drawing-room listening to her mother-in-law's comments on this and that and trying to keep up her temper for frederick's sake when the old lady finds fault with her management of the children the latter that is tommy and mabel have been sent to the pantomime by sir george and barbara with her husband have dropped in towards the close of the day to see lady monkton with a view to recovering the children there and taking them home with them sir george having expressed a wish to see the little ones after the play and hear tommy's criticisms on it which he promised himself would be lively he had already a great belief in the powers of tommy's descriptions in the meantime the children have not returned and conversation it must be confessed languishes miss lestrange who is present in a cap of enormous dimensions and a temper calculated to make life hideous to her neighbours scarcely helps to render more bearable the dullness of everything sir george in a corner is buttonholing frederick and saddening him with last accounts of the scapegrace barbara has come to her final pretty speech silence seems imminent when suddenly lady monkton flings into a bombshell that explodes and carries away with it all fear of commonplace dullness at all events you have a sister i believe says she to barbara in a tone she fondly but erroneously imagines gracious yes says barbara softly but curtly the fact that joyce's existence has never hitherto been alluded to by lady monkton renders her manner even colder than usual which is saying everything she lives with you yes says barbara again lady monkton as if a little put out by the determinate taciturnity of her manner moves forward on her seat and pulls the lace lappets of her dove grey cap more over the front impatiently long soft lappets they are 
falling from a gem of a little cap made of priceless lace and with a beautiful old face beneath to frame a face like an old miniature and as stern as most of them but charming for all that and perfect in every line makes her so useful no doubt growls miss lestrange from the opposite lounge her evil old countenance glowing with a desire to offend that's why one harbours one's poor relations to get something out of them this is a double-barrelled explosion one barrel for the detested wife of the good frederick one for the sister she has befriended to that sister's cost true says lady monkton with an uncivil little upward glance at barbara for once because it suits her she has accepted her sister's argument and determined to take no heed of her scarcely veiled insult she helps you no doubt is useful with the children i hope moneyless girls should remember that they are born into the world to work not to idle i am afraid she is not as much help to me as you evidently think necessary says barbara smiling but not pleasantly she is very seldom at home in the summer at all events it is abominable to her to think that these hateful old people should regard joyce her pretty joyce as a mere servant a sisterly maid of all work and if not with you where then asked lady monkton indifferently and as if more with a desire to keep up the dying conversation that from any acute thirst of knowledge she stays a good deal with lady baltimore says barbara feeling weary and rather disgusted ah indeed sort of companion a governess i suppose a long pause mrs monkton's dark eyes grow dangerously bright and a quick colour springs into her cheeks no begins she in a low but dignified tone and then suppresses herself she can't she mustn't quarrel with freddy's people my sister is neither companion nor governess to lady baltimore says she icily she is only her friend friend repeats the old lady as if not quite understanding a great friend repeats barbara calmly lady monkton's astonishment is even more insulting than her first question but barbara has made up her mind to bear all things they are friends and friends puts in miss lestrange with her most offensive air a very embarrassing silence falls on this barbara would say nothing more an inborn sense of dignity forbidding her but this does not prevent a very natural desire on her part to look at her husband not so much to claim his support as to know if he has heard one glance assures her that he has a pause in the conversation with his father has enabled him to hear everything barbara has just time to know that his brow is black and his lips ominously compressed before she sees him advance toward his mother you seem to be very singularly ignorant of my wife's status in society his beginning is a rather terrible tone when barbara with a little graceful gesture checks him she puts out her hand and smiles up at him a wonderful smile under the circumstances ah that is just it she says sweetly but with determination she is ignorant where we are concerned joyce and i if she had only spared time to ask a little question or two but as it is the whole speech is purposely vague but full of contemptuous rebuke delicately veiled it is nothing i assure you freddy your mother is not to be blamed she has not understood that is all i fail even now to understand says the old lady with a somewhat tremulous attempt at self-assertion so do i says the antique upon the lounge near her bristling with a wrath so warm that it has unsettled the noble structure on her head and placed it in quite an artful situation right over her left ear i see nothing to create wrath in the mind of any one in the idea of a young uh, she comes to a dead pause she had plainly been going to say young person but frederick's glare had been too much for her it has frightened her into good behaviour and she changes the obnoxious word into one more complaisant a young what demands he imperiously freezing his aunt with a stony stare young girl returns she turning down a little but still betraying malevolence of a very advanced order in her voice and expression 
i see nothing derogatory in the idea of a young girl devoid of fortune taking a again she would have said something insulting the word situation is on her lips but the venom in her is suppressed a second time by her nephew go on says he sternly taking a um, position in a nice family says she almost spitting out the words like a bad old cat she has a position in a very nice family says monkton readily in mine as companion friend playfellow in fact anything you like of the light order of servitude we all serve my dear aunt though that idea doesn't seem to have come home to you we must all be in bondage to each other in this world the only real freedom is to be gained in the world to come you have never thought of that well think of it now to be kind to be sympathetic to be even commonly civil to people is to fulfil the law's demands you go too far she's old freddy barbara has scarcely time to whisper when the door is thrown open and dicky brown followed by felix dysart enters the room it is a relief to everybody lady monkton rises to receive them with a smile miss lestrange looks into the teapot plainly she can still see some tea-leaves there rising she inclines the little silver kettle over them and creates a second deluge she has again made tea may she be forgiven going to give us some tea miss lestrange says dicky bearing down upon her with a beaming face she has given him some before this one can always depend upon you for good cup ah thanks dysart i can recommend this have a cup do no thank you says dysart who has secured a seat next to barbara and is regarding her anxiously while replying to her questions of surprise at seeing him in town at this time of year she is surprised too and a little shocked to see him look so ill dicky is still holding a brilliant conversation with miss lestrange who to him is a joy for ever didn't expect to see me here again so soon eh says he with a cheerful smile there you are wrong returns that spinster in the hoarse croak that distinguishes her the fact that you were here yesterday and couldn't reasonable be supposed to come again for a week made it at once a certainty that you would turn up immediately the unexpected is what always happens where you are concerned one of many my charms says mr brown gaily hiding his untasted cup by a skilful movement behind the sugar bowl verity you know is ever charming i'm a various person therefore i'm charming are you says miss lestrange grimly can you look at me and doubt it demands mr brown deep reproach in his eyes i can returns miss lestrange presenting an uncompromising front i can also suggest to you that those lumps of sugar are meant to put in the cups with the tea not to be consumed wholesale sugar plain is ruinous to the stomach and disastrous to the teeth true true says mr brown absently and both mine are so pretty miss lestrange rises to her feet and confronts him with a stony glare both what demands she eh uh, why both of them persists mr brown i think richard that the sooner you return to your hotel or whatever low hount you have chosen as your present abode the better it will be for all present why so demands mr brown indignantly what have i done now you know very well sir says miss lestrange your language is disgraceful you take an opportunity of turning an innocent remark of mine a kindly warning into a ribald good heavens says he uplifting brows and hands i never yet knew it was ribaldry to talk about one's teeth you were not talking about your teeth says miss lestrange sternly you said distinctly both of them just so says dicky i've only got to is that the truth richard with increasing majesty honest in june says mr brown unabashed and they are out of sight all you can see have been purchased and i shew your dear miss lestrange with anxious earnestness paid for one guinea the entire set a single tooth two and six who'd be without them well i'm sorry to hear it says miss lestrange reseating herself and regarding him still with manifest distrust to lose one's teeth so early in life speaks badly for one's moral conduct anyhow i shan't allow you to destroy your guinea worth i shall remove temptation from your path 
lifting the sugar bowl she removes it to her right side thus laying bare the fact that mr brown's cup of tea is still full to the brim it is the last stroke drink your tea says she to the stricken dicky in a tone that admits of no delay he drinks it meantime barbara has been very kind to felix dysart answering his roundabout questions that always have joys as their central meaning one leading remark of his is to the effect that he is covered with astonishment to find her and monkton in london is he surprised well no doubt yes joyce is in town too but she has not come out with her to-day have they been to the theatre very often joyce especially is quite devoted to it do they go much to the picture galleries well to one or two there is so much to be done and the children are rather exigent and demand all the afternoon but she had heard joyce say that she was going to-morrow to doré's gallery she thought tommy ought to be shown something more improving than clowns and wild animals and toy shops mr dysart at this point said he thought miss kavanagh was more reflective than one taking a careless view of her might believe barbara laughed do you take the reflective view says she do you recommend me to take the careless one demands he now looking fully at her there's a good deal of meaning in his question but barbara declines to recognize it she feels she has gone far enough in that little betrayal about doré's gallery she refuses to take another step she is already indeed a little frightened by what she has done if joyce should hear of it oh and yet how could she refrain from giving that small push to so deserving a cause no no i recommend nothing says she still laughing where are you staying with my cousins the seaton dysarts they had to come up to town about a tooth or a headache or neuralgia or something we shall never quite know what as it has disappeared whatever it is give me london smoke as a perfect cure for most elements it is astonishing what remarkable recoveries it can boost vera and her husband are like a couple of children even the pantomime isn't too much for them that reminds me the children ought to be here by this time says mrs monkton drawing out her watch they went to the afternoon performance i really think anxiously they are very late she has hardly spoken when a sound of little running feet up the stairs outside sets her maternal fears at rest nearer and nearer the sound they stop there is a distant scuffle the door is thrown violently open and tommy and mabel literally fall into the room End of chapter thirty three recording by monica rolly chapter thirty four of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by monica rolly april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter thirty four then seemed to me this world far less in size likewise it seemed to me less wicked far like points in heaven i saw the stars arise and longed for wings that i might catch a star least said soonest mended tommy is on his feet again in no time and has picked up mabel before you could say jack robinson and once again nothing daunted by their ignominious entry they rush up the room and precipitate themselves upon their mother this pious act being performed thomas sees fit to show some small attention to the other people present thomas says mr brown when he has shaken hands with him if you wait much longer without declaring yourself you will infallibly burst and that is always a rude thing to do in friend's drawing-room speak thomas or die you are evidently full of information well i won't tell you says tommy naturally indignant at this address he throws a resentful look at him over his shoulder while making his way to his grandfather there is a queer sort of sympathy understanding what you will between the child and the stern old man come here says sir george drawing tommy to him well and did you enjoy yourselves was it all your fancy painted it 
sir george has sunk into a chair with all the heaviness of an old man and the boy has crept between his knees and is looking up at him with his beautiful little face all aglow oh twas lovely says he twas splendid there was lights all over the house twas like night only twas night and that was grand and there were heaps of people a whole town was there and there were grandpa why did they have lamps there when it was daytime because they have no windows in a theatre says sir george patting the little hot fat hand that is lying on his arm with a strange sensation of pleasure in the touch of it no windows with big eyes opened wide not one then why have we windows asks tommy with an involuntary glance around him why are there windows anywhere it's ever so much nicer without them why can't we have lamps always like the theatre people why indeed says mr brown sympathetically sir george i hope you will take your grandson's advice to heart and block up all these absurd windows and let a proper ray of light descend upon us from the honest burner who cares for strikes not i well tommy we'll think about it says sir george and now go on you saw bluebeard says tommy almost roaring in the excitement of his delight a big bluebeard and he was just like the pictures of him at home with his toes curled up and the red towel around his head and the blue nightgown and a smitter in his hand a scimitar tommy suggests his mother gently eh says tommy well it's all the same says he after a pause replete with deep research and with a truly noble impartiality it is indeed says mr brown open encouragement in his eyes and so you saw mr bluebeard and did he see you oh he saw me cries mabel in a little whimpering tone he looked straight into the little house where we were and i saw his eye his horrid eye shaking her small head vigorously and it ran right into mine and he began to walk up to me and i she stops her pretty red lips quivering her blue eyes full of tears oh mabel was so frightened says tommy the bald she stuck her nose into nurse's fur cape and roared i didn't says mabel promptly you did says tommy indignant at being contradicted and she said it would never be worth a farthing ever after and well anyway you know mabel you didn't like the heads oh no i didn't i hated them they were all hanging to one side and there was nasty blood and they looked as if they were going to waggle concludes mabel with a terrified sob burying her own head in her mother's lap oh she is too young says barbara nervously clasping her little woman close to her in a quiet undemonstrative way but so as to make the child herself feel the protection of her arms too young for so dismal a sight says dysart stooping over and patting mabel's sunny curls with a kindly touch he is very fond of children as are all men good and bad i should not have let her go says mrs monkton with self-reproach such exhibitions are painful for young minds however harmless when she is older begins dysart still caressing the little head yes yes she is too young far too young says mrs monkton giving the child a second imperceptible hug one is never too young to learn the miseries of the world says miss lestrange in her most terrible tone why should a child be pampered and petted and shielded from all thoughts of harm and wrong as though they never existed it is false treatment it is a wilful deceiving of the growing mind one day they must wake to all the horrors of the world they should therefore be prepared for it steadily sternly unyieldingly what a grand what a strong nature says mr brown uplifting his hands in admiration you would then advocate the cause of the pantomime says he knowing well that the very name of theatre stinks in the nostrils of miss estrange far be it from me says she with a violent shake of her head may all such disreputable performances come to a bad end and a speedy one is my devout prayer but with a vicious glance at barbara i would condemn the parents who would bring their children up in a dark ignorance 
of the woes and vices of the world in which they must pass their lives i think as mabel has been permitted to look at the pernicious exhibition of this afternoon she should also be encouraged to look with calmness upon it if only to teach her what to expect from life good heavens says mr brown in a voice of horror is that what she has to expect rows of decapitated heads have you had private information miss lestrange is a rehearsal of the french revolution to be performed in london do you really believe the poor child is doomed to behold you ahead carried past the windows on a pike was the meaning in the artless prattle of our thomas just now when he condemned windows as a social nuisance or i suppose you think you are amusing interrupts the spinster malignantly it is plain that she objects to the idea of her head being on a pike at all events if you must jest on serious subjects i desire you richard to leave me out of your silly maunderings your will is my law says dicky rising i leave you he makes a tragic retreat and finding an empty chair near monkton takes possession of it i must protest against your opinion says dysart addressing miss lestrange with a smile children should be regarded as something better than mere lumps of clay to be experimentalized upon oh yes says barbara regarding the spinster gently but with ill-concealed aversion you cannot expect any one to agree with you there i for one could not i don't know that i ever asked you to says miss lestrange with such open impertinence that barbara flushes up to the roots of her hair silence falls on the room except for a light conversation being carried on between dicky and monkton both of whom have heard nothing lady monkton looks uncomfortable sir george hastens to the rescue surely you haven't told us everything tommy says he giving his grandson a pull toward him besides mr bluebeard what else was there lots of things says tommy vaguely coming back from an eager attention to miss lestrange's evil suggestion to a fresh remembrance of his past delights there was a band and it shouted nurse said it took the roof off her head but i looked and her bonnet didn't stir and there was the harlequin he was beautiful he shined like anything he was all over scales like a trout a queer fish says his grandfather he jumped about and beat things with a little stick he had and he danced and there was a window and he sprang right through it and he came up again and wasn't a bit hurt not a bit oh it was lovely grandpapa and so was his concubine his what says sir george his concubine his sweetheart that was her name says tommy confidently there is a ghastly silence lady monkton's pale old cheeks colour faintly miss lestrange glares as for barbara she feels the world has at last come to an end they will be angry with the boy her mission to london will have failed that vague hope of reconciliation through the children that she had yet scarcely allowed to herself need it to be said that mr brown has succumbed to secret but disgraceful mirth a good three-quarters of a full-sized handkerchief is already in his mouth a little more of the cambric and desperate suffocation will adorn the columns of the times in the morning sir george too what is the matter with him he is speechless from indignation one must hope what ails you grandpa demands tommy after a full minute's strict examination of him oh nothing nothing says sir george choking it is only that i'm glad you have so thoroughly enjoyed yourself and your harlequin and <laughs> your columbine columbine now mind and here's this for you tommy because you are such a good boy he opens the little grandson's hand and presses into the pink palm of it a sovereign thank you says tommy in a polite regulation tone he has been taught without a glance at his gift a touch of etiquette he has been taught to then the curious eyes of childhood wander to the palm and seeing the unexpected pretty gold thing lying there he colours up to the tips of his ears with surprise and pleasure then sudden compunction sizes on the kindly little heart the world is strange to him he knows but one or two here and there 
his father is poor a sovereign that is a gold piece would be rare with him why not rare with another though filled with admiration and gratitude for the giver of so big a gift the child's heart commands him not to accept it oh it is too much says he throwing his arms around sir george's neck and trying to press the sovereign back into his hand a shilling i'd like but that's such a lot of shillings and maybe you'd be wanting it this is all whispered in the softest tenderest way no no my boy says sir george whispering back and glad that he must whisper his voice even so sounds a little queer to himself how often he might have gladdened his child with a present a small one and until now keep it says he he has passed his hand round the little head and is pressing it against his breast may i really says tommy emancipating his head with a little jerk and looking at sir george with searching eyes you may indeed god bless you says tommy solemnly it is a startling remark to sir george but not so to tommy it is exactly what nurse had said to her daughter the day before she left ireland with tommy and mabel in charge when her daughter had brought her the half of her wages therefore it must be correct to supplement this blessing tommy flings his arms around sir george's neck and gives him a resounding kiss nurse had done that too to her daughter god bless you too my dear says sir george if not quite as solemnly with considerably more tenderness tommy's mother catching the words and the tone cheers up all is not lost yet the situation is saved tommy has won the day the inconsequent tommy of all people insult to herself she had endured but to have the children disliked would have been more than she could bear but tommy apparently is not disliked by the old man at all events that fact will be sweet to freddy after all who could resist tommy tears rise to the mother's eyes darling boy where is his like upon the whole wide earth nowhere she is disturbed in her rivalry by the fact that the originator of it is running toward her with one little closed fist outstretched how he runs his fat calves come twingling across the carpet see mummy what i've got grandpa gave it to me isn't he nice now i'll buy a watch like puppies you have made him very happy says barbara smiling at sir george over her boy's head she rises as she speaks and goes to where lady monkton is sitting to bid her good-bye i hope you will come soon again says lady monkton not cordially but as if compelled to it and i hope too pausing as if to gather herself together that when you do come you will bring your sister with you it will give me us pleasure to see her there is such a thirst of pleasure in the tone of the invitation that barbara feels her wrath rising within her i thank you she manages to say very calmly not committing herself either way and presently finds herself in the street with her husband and her children they had declined lady monkton's offer of the brougham to take them home it was a bad time says monkton while waiting at a crossing for a cab to come to them but you must try and not mind them if the fact that i'm always with you counts for anything it may help you to endure it what help could be like it says she tightening her hand on his arm that old woman my aunt she offended you but you must remember that she offends everybody you thought her abominable oh no i only thought her vulgar says mrs monkton it is the one revenge she permits herself monkton breaks into an irresistible laugh it isn't perfect it couldn't be unless she heard you says he the cab has come up now and he puts in the children and then his wife finally himself tommy crowns all says he with a retrospective smile eh says tommy who has the ears of Midas. your father says you are a social success and so does your mother says barbara smiling at the child's puzzled face and then giving him a loving little embrace End of chapter thirty four Recording by Monica Rolly.